Kids, never underestimate the power of destiny. One of the underlying assumptions of How I Met Your Mother is that Ted Mosby is a textbook good guy. Oh, Ted, you're such a good guy. He's basically a gender-swapped version of the classic starry-eyed female heroine from so many sitcoms and romantic comedies. Idealistic, vulnerable, and looking for his soulmate. It's like, okay, I'm ready. Where is she? But what if this given premise is wrong? What if instead of being a great guy, Ted is actually a delusional narcissist who only cares about what he wants, no matter who he hurts? What if he's the bad guy? Raise your hand if earlier today you hit on an engaged woman. Here's our take on why Ted Mosby is actually the secret villain of How I Met Your Mother. It's my birthday and you're telling me I'm not the one for you? It's like you, you lost the lottery. Oh, so dating you is like winning the lottery? Hi everyone, I'm Susanna. And I'm Deborah. And you're watching The, the Take. Be sure to share and subscribe and never miss a take. This video is brought to you by Skillshare, an online learning community where millions of people come together to take classes that fuel their creative journey. If you are one of the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below, you'll get two free months of Skillshare Premium. So join today and start exploring your creativity. From the very first episode, How I Met Your Mother presents Ted as a sweet, special guy who should be endeared to us by his sensitive desire for a blissful happily ever after with The One. So do you think you'll ever get married? Well, maybe eventually some fall day, possibly in Central Park. But over time, Ted's romantic ideas come to appear more like narcissistic delusions, which he projects onto a series of unlucky women who get caught up in his path of destruction. Look, obviously you can't tell a woman you just met you love her, but it sucks that you can't. When we say that Ted is delusional in this context, we mean that he holds false beliefs based on an incorrect interpretation of reality. He believes that anything he feels for another person must be real and reciprocal, because he interprets reality as a romantic epic in which he is the protagonist. Sometimes when you're about to give up on your love life forever for the 17th time, destiny intervenes. And he refuses to allow other people's perspectives and emotions to factor into his assessment of facts. She can't say it's not meant to be. It is meant to be. And you know why? Because I mean it to be. We see this from the moment in the first episode when Ted quickly decides that Robin is his dream girl. It was like something from an old movie, where the sailor sees the girl across the crowded dance floor, turns to his buddy and says, see that girl? I'm gonna marry her someday. Even though they just met, and his intensity makes her visibly uncomfortable. Robin's feelings and interpretation of reality don't matter to Ted, except insofar as they're obstacles to be overcome. His desires take precedence over the desires of others. His feelings determine the truth. It's a great look, but you're looking at the wrong girl. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Ted is the kind of guy who won't even apologize when he's clearly wrong. Well, at least you apologized. You apologized, didn't you? I'm sorry, but I'm not apologizing. A sign that he's unwilling to question his perspective of events, or challenge his assumption that because he's inherently virtuous, nothing he does can be that bad. I'm exhausted from pretending I'm not in love with her. I think that makes this okay. Oh, please, you just want to get laid. The founder of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud, said that when one is wrapped up in delusional behavior, he becomes a madman. And Ted's delusions frequently lead to behavior that makes him look like a madman to others. When you love someone, you just, you, you don't stop, ever. Even when people roll their eyes or call you crazy, even then, especially then. After his initial failed pursuit of Robin, he's so insistent on bringing her as a plus one to a wedding that he almost breaks up the couple getting married in the process. Then I'm gonna kill Ted. But when at the last minute Robin can't make the wedding, Ted quickly projects his romantic delusions onto a new target, Victoria. And just like that, Ted has moved on from the love of his life, Robin, to someone whose name he doesn't even know. 24 hours ago, you were begging, begging. 
begging me to bring some other girl to my wedding and now you're over her? The show is full of examples where Ted acts selfishly and screws over women, while his flattering idea of himself allows him to justify a pattern of harmful behavior. You lied and said you were broken up with Victoria before you actually were, so you could try to nail Robin and you wound up losing both girls in one night? Take the time that he uses a matchmaking service, only to have no matches, likely because his standards are so absurdly specific. There are absolutely no women out there for you. When it turns out that the one woman he's compatible with has already been matched up, Ted does the obvious thing and sneaks into her files, visits her office under false pretenses, and then uses stolen information to trick her into loving him. Summer Breeze is my guilty pleasure song. It's been stuck in my head ever since I heard it this weekend at brunch. I love brunch. Why should it matter that she and her fiancé are looking forward to their wedding if Ted's dream of the one is at stake? Don't you think it's a little impulsive for you to proposition an engaged woman you don't even know? See, we're both impulsive. We're perfect for each other. There's the episode where he aggressively pursues, even stalks, Maggie, the ultimate girl next door, using his self-perception as the good guy who wants love as cover for treating a vulnerable woman just out of a relationship like a prize to be won. And now a very single and available Maggie Wilkes is on her way to this very spot. I sent a cab with a female driver so she'd have no other interaction with a man until she got to me. Or when he leaves his own mother's wedding and refuses to give a speech because he thinks it's not fair that his mother is getting remarried before he's had a chance to have a wedding. I have to leave. Wait, Ted. What about your toast? Ted can't conceive of a world where his desires aren't validated by reality. I think for the most part, if you're really honest with yourself about what you want out of life, life gives it to you and his single-minded faith in his fantasies makes him incredibly skillful at explaining why all of those previously mentioned mistakes and manipulations were in service of a bigger good guy picture. If you're looking for the word that means caring about someone beyond all rationality and wanting them to have everything they want, no matter how much it destroys you, it's love. Since his narration is always in our ear crafting this alternate version of reality, we can easily fall into the trap of taking his narrative as objective truth. And as hard as it was at the time, in the end we both got what we wanted. But let's step back to look at things from the perspectives of some of the women in his life. So when you tell this story to your friends, could you avoid the word psycho? <laughs> I'd prefer eccentric. To Victoria, Ted is the guy who throws away a lifetime with someone he loves to stay friends with a woman he once cheated on her with. I really hope you get her something. To Royce, he's the guy who expects his baggage to be accepted without reservation. It feels so good to have told you all that stuff about me. I'm really glad I can open up to you. But immediately rejects her when she opens up about her own imperfections. Yeah, you gotta go. To Stella, he's the guy who practically forces her into a relationship, complains that things aren't moving fast enough, and then breaks up with her when she moves faster. She invited you to a wedding? Six months from now, as in, We'll be together six months from now. After then proposing to her out of the blue, he invites both of their exes to the wedding without consulting her, essentially pushing her back into the arms of her child's father, Tony, and later reappears in her life to badmouth her so badly that Tony temporarily breaks up with her, while Ted refuses to help fix the mess he caused. I love him. Oh, you love him, so what, you're, you're appealing to the romantic in me? When Tony makes a movie about their love triangle, Ted is outraged to see himself portrayed as the villain and Tony as the hero. Because for once, he's lost control of the narrative. This is a terrible movie, and it got everything wrong. Ted only feels better after Marshall reassures him of the fundamental belief that holds his universe together. The guy called Ted Mosby, the guy who's uncynical and sincere. I believe that deep down, you're still that guy. I am still that guy. Then there's Robin. From her perspective, she's a young journalist who moved to New York to follow her professional dreams and happens to meet a cute guy at a bar one night. They have a nice date, but before they can head upstairs, she has to run out to cover a story. Surely she can see this guy some other time. Except in this case, the guy shows back up later that night but before they can start making out, he drops a bomb on her. I think I'm in love with you. What? This is a major red flag. And after all that, she has to wake up the next morning and find her doormat covered in vomit. 
for Robin, this isn't a huge deal. She went out with a guy, it got a little weird, she can move on. But then she runs into Ted's friends at the bar and admits to Lily that while she likes Ted, she's looking for something casual. And he's just looking for something a little bit more serious than I am. I mean, the most I can handle right now is something casual. This just stays between us, right? Next thing she knows, Ted is casually three days in a row inviting her to his 72-hour party. I wish your party was tonight. It is, the party's tonight. She's new in town and wants to meet people, so she shows up on the third night, only to find that Ted constructed these parties just for her. I didn't throw this party to set you up with Carlos, or the one before that. Robin should probably get the hell away from this guy at this point, but she likes his friends and doesn't know many folks in the city. I just haven't met a lot of good people so far. So she continues hanging out with the gang, and she and Ted transition into friends. Eventually, Robin does start having feelings for Ted, so she gives him a chance and agrees to accompany him to a friend's wedding. You want to be my date? Your date? I'd love to. But when she shows up late because of a work conflict, she sees that Ted has already refocused his romantic energy on a woman that he just met. Despite being hurt, Robin tries to be a supportive friend about Ted's new relationship, waiting until it seems like his long-distance relationship has ended to make a move. We broke up. Except this is a lie. It was your girlfriend. So from Robin's perspective, Ted is someone who has emotionally pressured her and tried to trick her into dating him, only to leave her behind at a moment's notice when she doesn't fit into his schedule, before proving he's capable of both lying to and cheating on women he supposedly loves. Soon, she'll learn that he's also the sort of guy who, not long after the lying, cheating incident, shows up to the dinner where she's getting an award with a hot date he thinks is a prostitute, just to rub it in her face. Mary, uh, you want to go upstairs? And the first season's not even over yet. Ted breaks into Robin's apartment and, in front of a hired string quartet, awkwardly demands an immediate answer about their romantic future. I need an answer. If you want me to say yes right now, I, I can't do that. Well, if it's not yes, then... It's a no. After Robin does start dating Ted, she has to deal with his lying about all the stuff in his apartment that's from his exes. Whose moisturizer is this, Ted? Um, my sister's. Demanding that she send her beloved dogs up to her aunt's farm. Yes, I want you to get rid of your dogs. Shaming her for the number of men she slept with. And then there was Derek, and counting you, that puts a total up to... Oh, I got your total. And proving that he can't be trusted to keep her secrets. I can't believe you told us Robin's secret. What? How can I keep something like that to myself? Most importantly, they break up because Ted isn't willing to accept Robin for who she is. In five years, I probably want to be married. And I probably want to be in Argentina. Argentina? As much as he loves being with Robin, he loves his vision of a picket fence, two-kid future more. And that would be okay if he accepted that trade-off and committed to their resulting friendship. Instead, he periodically seizes on moments when she's vulnerable to profess his undying love for her. But he couldn't look past this. I mean, who could? I could. I love you, Robin. How long have you been hung up on Robin? Eight years? And you're still killing yourself to fetch dumb little trinkets for her. And right to the end of the series, keeps trying to force her into his idea of a happy ending, which all along she's made clear she doesn't want. Just tell me. Do you love me? No. So a lot of the time, the way Ted acts toward the woman of his dreams kind of sucks. Good night, psycho. Maybe you've got more in common with Barney. The show initially sets up Barney and Ted as the yin and yang of their social circle, with Barney as a reckless misogynist and Ted as a kind-hearted romantic. But in reality, these two are more similar than they are distinct. Hey, Barney, I need your help. This hottie I'm talking to is meeting a friend at a club, so I need a wingman. Throughout the series, Barney serves as Ted's diabolical sidekick, the friendly demon in his ear, enabling behaviors that should be antithetical for the archetypal nice guy. I prostitute to Robin's banquet. The only people who will know are you, me, and Marshall. No one will suspect a thing. Ted makes a performance of distancing himself from Barney, but these half-hearted protests never stop him from going along with Barney's plans. Do you think maybe you might need a wingman again? 
I do. There are also numerous instances when Ted out Barney's Barney. After he decides that his bad behavior is being rewarded at a St. Patrick's Day party they attend. Okay, it's official. Do bad things, good things happen. He quickly ditches their two dates outside because he hears that the girls inside the club are drunker. He lies about who he is to put champagne and caviar on someone else's tab, and he hooks up with a married woman. You kissed a married woman, Ted. You committed credit card fraud. As a professor, he pursues a relationship with a student at his college even when he knows it could put her scholarship, as well as his job, at risk. Classic Barney behavior. And that's not even counting all the times that Ted can't even remember the names of the women he dated. I was dating this girl named... Oh God, what was her name? For the sake of the story, let's call her. Everyone, this is Blah Blah. Mounting evidence suggests that deep down, Ted is much more like Barney than his other best friend, honest, devoted, monogamist Marshall. Here? Yeah. It's the t-shirt, isn't it? No. A little. Something is seriously wrong with you. Barney himself sees this resemblance between him and Ted. See, for all your big talk about being ready for a relationship, deep down you're single. It's your default setting. He speaks of the little Barney inside Ted controlling his behavior. You know what's in the back of your brain secretly controlling your every move? A little Barney. And we actually see Ted blame Barney for his own misdeeds. That was Barney. That was you, Ted. As if on some level he does think of this friend as an id-like inner presence instigating his worst behaviors. Well, hello. Sorry, babe. I gotta take this. At points, the show even suggests that Barney is secretly a nicer guy than Ted. Don't sleep with Anita. Done. <laughs> the night before dinner. No. How about you? Are you interested? Yeah. Just consider how each of them reacts when Lily leaves Marshall and goes to San Francisco. Ted decides that being a good friend to Marshall means calling Lily, who's also one of his best friends, a slur that's most likely the C word. You gotta get over that Grinch. But I didn't say Grinch. Barney, on the other hand, seeing all of the pain that Marshall is in, takes constructive action. He goes on a secret mission to find Lily and beg her to go back to New York. You have to come home. You and Marshall belong together. And to top it all off, he makes sure that no one knows about his kind act. Never, ever tell anyone I was here. I will deny it tooth and nail. This trip never happened. Ted is the kind of friend who guilts his besties into throwing parties three nights in a row so he can potentially seduce a girl, not caring that Marshall has an important law school paper to write. I'm jeopardizing my law career so you can throw not one, not two, but three parties for some girl that you just met who's probably not even gonna show up. But Barney repeatedly takes steps to materially improve his friends' lives. I finished your video resume on my own, messengered it to every station in the city. A guy from Channel 8 called. He loved you. He wanted you to come in and audition. One year, he even uses his massive Christmas bonus after some initial selfish temptation to donate $10,000 to Sam Gibbs' congregation. And there's more. Along with racks of his suits so that underprivileged people could have clothes for job interviews. So while Barney is often a monster, he's capable of selfless deeds. Ted, not so much. She's not getting rid of the dogs. What's the matter with you? Even I wouldn't do that. Ted's actively identifying as a good guy is what makes him so dangerous. His delusional belief that he's the leading man in a romantic comedy written by God and starring all of humanity as his supporting cast allows him to let himself off the hook for awful behavior. What could she mean when she says no? I don't know. It is totally cryptic. This is far from over. Because how can anything he does ever be that bad if his intentions are so good? You put yourself and a girl you like in some romantic setting, the stars line up, and shazam. This mindset is also why Ted is miserable for almost the entire nine-season run of the show. Real life will never match the fantasies of romantic grandeur that he has constructed in his head. This is perfectly exemplified by his obsession with winning a second chance with Natalie, the girl he dumped on her birthday. When he's not with her, he becomes irrationally convinced that life with her would be perfect. I had so many fond memories of her. The tea candles on her dresser, the sock monkey collection on her bed, 
her smile. But almost as soon as he gets what he asks for, he's dissatisfied and is so anxious to discard her that he can't even respect her feelings enough to wait a day and avoid ruining her birthday a second time. I want to break up. I don't think you're the one for me. There's actually a psychological term to describe Ted's favored seduction technique. Love bombing, which is a common method used by delusional narcissists to blindside their partners with affection early in relationships. I came home and I found him waiting in my apartment with a string quartet. Oh, that's so sweet. Okay, yes, it's sweet in theory, but isn't it also kind of crazy? While this might not sound so bad, according to Professor Suzanne Deggs White, individuals who are especially high in the trait of narcissism may see others simply as objects to satisfy their desire for connection or manipulation. Hey Robin, it's Teddy Bear. Need a little honey? When it comes to their cultural impact on viewers, characters like Ted Mosby run the dangerous risk of modeling a self-serving good guy persona that's more likely to encourage narcissistic behavior in men than show them what truly loving conduct looks like. I just had decent sex with an awful human being. I am back! <laughs> It's inevitable that viewers will look to popular examples like Ted to see how a romantic guy acts, but in reality, they're learning a troubling set of behaviors. Hello? Hey, Ted. Hey, Tiffany. Sorry, Henrietta, something came up. And as the show demonstrates again and again, this pattern of behavior not only hurts Ted's partners, but it also makes him deeply unhappy and unable to appreciate the many blessings that fill his life. We don't actually see what happens after Ted finally gets what he's wanted for nearly a decade and unites with Robin. But based on what we've witnessed, is there really any reason to believe that he's at last going to be happy? How could any reality ever live up to the impossible dream he's long nurtured of fairy tale bliss with this woman? There's no top five, Robin. There's just a top one, and it's you. So should we feel bad about enjoying the various romantic misadventures of Ted and How I Met Your Mother? Absolutely not. But we should be careful to remember that Ted represents a cautionary tale about what happens when delusional fantasies prevent you from being open to connecting with other human beings as they really are. Let her go. No, this is destiny. No, Ted, this is forcing it. Maybe the lesson that Ted should have taught his kids in the drawn-out story of How He Met Their Mother is look to your Uncle Marshall as a better standard for how a good guy actually behaves. Some people aren't gonna get their gifts in time for Christmas. Sadly, no. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to get notified about all our new videos. This video is brought to you by Skillshare, an online learning community that offers affordable classes designed to fit your schedule and skill level. When you join Skillshare, you'll get access to thousands of workshops taught by amazing professionals, and you'll receive feedback and encouragement from your fellow creatives. One Skillshare original you can check out right now is Greg McEwen's class on productivity, featuring advice straight from his New York Times bestselling book, Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. Right now, Skillshare is offering our viewers two months access to all their classes for free. But that's only if you're one of the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below. So join today and jumpstart your creative journey.